Welcome to ILTV's Elections Arena. I'm Aaron Porras, and today in the ring, Israel's new 35th government is set to be inaugurated, but many ministerial appointments are still either unknown or causing controversy. So joining us to discuss is former member of Knesset, Rabbi Dov Lippmann, and Davidi Hermelin, the president of the International Center for Public Diplomacy in Israel. Now to start, Israel's newest government will officially be inaugurated soon, bringing an end to a one and a half year stalemate in the Knesset, and already there are some major changes to the government being reported. So first, let's actually talk about some of the ministerial appointments. Yuli Edelstein wants to be Knesset speaker again, and he's refusing the offer of education ministry. Uh, he's saying that he'd sooner actually leave the coalition than be the education minister, but the Blue and White Party specifically asked that he not be Knesset speaker again. So is, is Likud, is Netanyahu obeying this sort of veto? Are they honoring blue and white? Or is there some other reason maybe to keep Yuli Edelstein from this position? Uh, according to the last uh, rumors in the political arena, Mr. Edelstein is supposed to be now the Minister of Health. Well, I'm not sure that this is uh, uh, for sure uh, right now, but uh, I hope that he will be part of the coalition. I think that the behavior of a blue and white party is unheard, unacceptable, and we should remember the issue itself. Mr. Edelstein defended the democracy from the unacceptable verdict of the Supreme Court, which was against the law. And uh, I think that uh, this is one of the things that uh, uh, make me, uh, makes me sad as a Likud member that we are victims of political blackmail by very small fraction, blue and white, which, are, which is using our uh, wish to avoid a fourth election, com election campaign. And uh, unfortunately, they use it to blackmail rotation, big government, and the uh, uh, veto on uh, some uh, 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 of our uh, leaders. I, I'm very sorry that this is the situation, but unfortunately, I'm, I, I don't think that it will be changed. Rabbi Lippmann, what's your take on all of this? Do, do you think that Yariv Levin would be a better Knesset speaker uh, if for the government or in terms of Blue and White's perspective? It's not better or better. Or, uh, sorry. Certainly from Blue and White's perspective, they prefer not to see Yuli Edelstein in the position. If I can speak for a moment from Yuli's side, I don't think he'll leave the coalition. I recall uh, Ruvi Rivlin was removed from the position of Speaker of the Knesset, the 19th Knesset, which I served in, and he was a regular member of Knesset for that term, and he used that time both for parliamentary work and to build his candidacy for President of Israel. So Yuli could certainly, if he doesn't want to accept the Health Ministry or the Education Ministry, he could could be just a member of Knesset and work towards his next step, which I do believe is a desire to be the president of Israel. And I think he'd rather avoid the clash with blue and white at this point. So it's very possible that will be the path that he will take. Why, why is it, for those who, who maybe don't understand the internal politics here, why is it better to be the Knesset speaker in terms of a future presidential campaign than, as you say, the health ministry or, or, or just an MK? The Knesset Speaker is the third position, so to speak, in Israel. You have the Prime Minister, the President, the Knesset Speaker. He's put on display in many important ceremonies. He also is in a place as the Speaker where he's able to work with coalition and opposition together and not be blamed for any policies like he would be in the Health Ministry or Education Ministry. It's a position which is a perfect platform for being a uniter. And remember, to be the President of Israel, all you need is 61 votes from members of Knesset. It's a vote within the Knesset, and you just mean a majority of Knesset members. So it's a perfect platform to be able to build that candidacy. But again, even as a member of Knesset, he would also have the ability to do so. If he rejects the coalition and goes to the opposition, he's basically closed the doors towards any significant future positions. And that's why I don't believe that will be the direction that he would take. All right. Now, Davidi, I want to come back to you for this next question, because similarly to, to this whole mix-up with uh, with Edelstein, Amir Ochana and Miri Regev, who are both Netanyahu loyalists, are battling for the role of public security minister, but it looks like Ochana is going to get it. Uh, why is Ochana better for this role than Miri Regev? I think uh, both of them are very talented. I'm a personal friend of uh, uh, both, and uh, I cannot judge between them. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, if Amir Ochana, uh, to answer your question, if Amir Ochana will be a minister uh, in this uh, ministry, 
I'm sure that uh, he has the necessary courage uh, to face, uh, I would even say, some corruption in this system. We saw the corrupted behavior against the prime minister, how they investigated him with things which are not felonies at all. And I think uh, that also from other perspectives, this system should be shaked. And uh, as we saw the experience with Ms. Uh, Amir Ohana in the Minister, Ministry of Justice, uh, he already uh, uh, proved that he has uh, the necessary courage to face uh, uh, such, uh, I would say, brutal and uh, very uh, strong uh, uh, systems. And uh, this system, like the justice system, uh, is, uh, it needs huge reform. Mm. Rabbi Lippmann, do you, you know, do you believe that that's true, that Ohana would maybe step to uh, corruption a little bit more strongly? Would he be a better preventative towards corruption in the government? I can't weigh in on that specific issue. I do know that he certainly has a background within the uh, within the Shabak and within the issue of security. So uh, I don't have a specific information about uh, who would be good or not good uh, in the specific positions. I do know that Netanyahu is in a tough situation because both Regev and Ohana have been loyalists to him, and this is viewed as a reward for that. So it's going to be difficult for whoever doesn't get that position. Netanyahu will have to find some other way to reward them for being loyal to him during uh, his challenging last few years. Do you think that this is the sort of position that whoever doesn't get it will, will somehow maybe lose loyalty for Netanyahu? Is that on the line? I don't think lose loyalty. I think everyone sees Netanyahu as being very strong in Likud, and uh, no one is going to look to uh, to move away from that. And we even see those who, so to speak, rebelled within the Gidon Sar camp are not being given anywhere close to significant positions. I don't think it will lead to any kind of rebellion or moving away from him, uh, but I do know that they both view themselves as deserving of this prime position because of the fact that they have been loyal to the prime minister. All right. Now, Rabbi... Speaking of this public security ministry position, Gilad Erdan, who is the current public security minister, is now likely to be moved to the United States to serve as both ambassador to the UN and to the United States. Can he effectively hold both of those positions? Can anyone effectively hold those positions? I think it's going to be a significant challenge, and in order to do so, and first of all, Gilad is very capable and very talented, and I'm certainly very happy with the choice for him representing Israel in the United States. He's been behind the fight against the BDS for the last few years and has done a very good job, and, and I think that he's fully capable of filling either of those positions. In order to succeed at both, he's going to have to have strong deputies, both in Washington and in New York, that's for sure. But I also understand why the prime minister was in a tough place in terms of filling that position. Remember, uh, if in November, Ron Dermer is going to be leaving from Washington, so at that point, it's a very short time for anyone to go to Washington because a year later, uh, Benny Gantz will become prime minister and he'll put his person in as the ambassador. So it would be very hard to find someone to fill the position for one year. So this was a way of accomplishing that, giving Gilad Erdan both the United Nations and this position in Washington. But again, in order to succeed, he will have to have two strong people in place in both locations. I don't think it's an ideal scenario, but I do think that it's possible, assuming that things are put in place properly. Davidi, why not keep Erdan as public security minister? You know, because a lot of people are saying that uh, they view this appointment as a way to distance uh, Gilad Erdan from Netanyahu. Why not keep him in Israel? Well, this is political tradition that uh, once in a while uh, ministers uh, move to another ministry or to another position. The position of uh, ambassador to the UN and to Washington, both of them are uh, uh, very appreciated positions. And uh, I believe that uh, under the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, at least, uh, the options to express a uh, uh, important policy which will uh, design the future in Israel and, the, and in the Middle East. Uh, the opportunity is a, a very unique one and uh, I think that in a way this is upgrading and not a, you know, a, a compromise. Uh, I hope that uh, after a while also Minister Radan, uh, if he doesn't agree uh, with that now, I hope he is, but if not, uh, I hope that he will uh, feel like that when he will look back. 
Well, on a similar note, there are a lot of accusations, allegations that Netanyahu typically tends to appoint people to uh, you know, strong positions that he thinks he can sort of control in a way. Uh, does that have any bearing on, on his decisions to appoint Ohana or, or Regev or Erdan or anybody else? Do you know any politician who wouldn't behave like that? Is, it, is that typical to a Prime Minister Netanyahu? Yes, he is the Prime Minister and he would like to nominate people which are talented uh, and uh, in a f functional way to the position uh, they will uh, fill. And uh, I think that uh, any one of the names uh, you mentioned uh, are uh, qualified enough uh, to be in the front of the Israeli uh, leadership. It's true that when we have Netanyahu, always when we try to compare to him, everyone, uh, uh, you know, has uh, uh, something to uh, to look for to uh, to be promoted to his level because he's a, a superstar in the world class. But I think that from any uh, any by any uh, uh, criteria, they are very talented. You you saw the reforms of uh, Miri Regev in uh, her former ministry. You saw the uh, the brave of Amir Ohana uh, in his uh, ministry of uh, the Ministry of Justice, and uh, we know all the talents uh, uh, which uh, Prime uh, Minister Dan is uh, uh, blessed uh, by. And I really th I believe that all of them will make great job, and the Prime Minister made uh, the right decision. All right, now, uh, Rabbi Libman, I want to I move to you, because Benny Gantz right now, as far as his ministerial appointments are concerned, he's playing it very close to the vest. He said that until the inauguration, he's not going to announce, even to his own ministers, who will take on which portfolio. Why do you think that is? Why is he keeping people in the dark? You have to remember that Benny Gantz is talking about a party with about 17 members of Knesset and 15, 16 minister positions uh, to give out. There's certainly a lot of battling that's going on uh, within, which is natural uh, for people who view themselves as worthy of those positions. So in order to, I would say, keep the peace uh, I think he's chosen this approach of keeping it very close to his chest. I'm sure behind the scenes there's significant discussions being going on as they try to figure out who's best for what position. And remember, Blue and White has another challenge, and that is how do they make sure they have effective members of Knesset? Remember, you have the members of Knesset who leave to go to their ministries. They're no longer functioning within the committees at that point. So Benny Gantz has to figure out who does he leave behind, so to speak, in the Knesset to make sure that they're functioning within the committees and that he has a strong legislative branch within his party as well. So there's a lot of moving pieces that are going on for Gantz at this time. You, Again, as I said, as much as they're not announcing it publicly behind the scenes, people are certainly in discussions with him about who would be best for which ministry. But I think they want to avoid all the public commotion as they try to fit everybody into the right places. And then by Thursday, we'll know exactly who was chosen for what. Well, so how much, how much trust or faith do you think Gantz can still place in his former partners uh, from Yeshatid and Telem, the, the former blue and white factions that are now in the opposition? How much trust can he maybe place in them to uphold some of his ideologies, even from the opposition? Oh, zero. Uh, he can't rely on Yeshatid Telem uh, for anything in terms of the parliamentary work. Uh, the, the break that took place is has been quite strong. Uh, we've seen language being hurled from side to side, which is really difficult to see, actually, from people who are working together so closely for so long. So I, I don't think he can rely on them. Remember, Yair Lapid himself came out and said that the moment that Netanyahu wants to collapse this government, uh, his party would join together with him to make that happen. So Gantz has to rely on those within his own party. At some point, they're going to try to apply some level of what's called the Norwegian law to enable the members of Knesset who become ministers to actually leave the Knesset. But it's right. complicated because, sure. remember, they drew, they ran together with Yeshatid, so that would enable Yeshatid members to come into the Knesset. They're working all that out. So all this is happening behind the scenes, and Thursday we'll know a lot more in terms of what final decisions have been made. Davidi, what, what about the unity now within the opposition itself? Do you think that, you know, Yeshatid, Telem, and, and Yamina under Naftali Bennett, former right-wing parties, might actually become cohesive, or are they kind of just a smattering of parties with their own, with their own agendas? First of all, I, uh, I, hope that, uh, I still hope that the uh, Yamina party will join the coalition. This is their natural, uh, uh, natural 
placed B. Uh, but if they will stay in the opposition, of course, in uh, in few uh, domestic issues, they will uh, cooperate uh, with uh, Yashatid and maybe even uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Lieberman. Uh, but uh, this will not be a, co uh, uh, you know, they will, it will not be united. Maybe they will cooperate, but this is uh, not the same political family. And the Amina is a party with ideology. While Yeshatid is a party, oh, and sorry, since the, uh, Rabbi Lipman is not there, uh, I can say now uh, that they are a, a group, most of them, let's say, group of opportunists. So, uh, not everyone. <laughs> so, uh, I don't really think that uh, 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 there is something, you know, to unite with. There are, these are people who can see only themselves very brutal, always tell bad things about the prime minister with obsession, which is very ridiculous. Uh, they support uh, the actions of the Supreme Court, which are against the law. They support the corrupted behavior of the police. They support the corrupted behavior of the legal system, uh, which is against the prime minister based on a uh, political agenda. And uh, this makes me very sorry, and I don't really think that this party has a bright future. Maybe they will be in the parliament, and also blue and white. But uh, this is an alliance of people which are lazy enough. Uh, uh, they are too lazy to run in primaries of democratic parties. So they are celebrities. They have uh, uh, very handsome leaders. And they, they run for right. elections uh, to represent people who, from this uh, reason or another, doesn't like right. the... Well we'll, the, well, we'll have the, to see how, how well they work together on a lot of those issues. But I actually want to move on now to the health ministry, because that's, that's kind of a big bombshell ministry right now. It's become sort of a social pariah, really, within the government, because uh, Health Minister Yaakov Litzman from, from United Toward Judaism has tendered his resignation. He wants to move on to the Housing and Construction Ministry. Then you have Moshe Bar Simontov, the Director General of the Health Ministry, who uh, has just tendered his resignation. And yet, almost nobody is in the running to, to take over. Why do you think that is? Why does nobody want to be the Health Minister? You're in a situation now where obviously we're, we're coming out of this very difficult health situation. We know based on the science that this is not going away. It will come back at other times in one form or another. And therefore, most people don't want to be in a position of challenge, of difficulty, of having to rehabilitate uh, from a very difficult situation. Now, to be fair, I do know that Blue and White did ask for it. They wanted to give it over to a medical uh, professional, mm -hmm. uh, the, chief, the head of the Sheba Hospital. Uh, to his credit, Naftali Bennett uh, asked for uh, the ministry and wanted to put together a systematic plan. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like they're going in either of those directions. And now the offer on the table uh, is to Yuli Edelstein for it. Uh, I do hope that whoever does get the ministry will be someone who wants it, someone who sees it as a challenge which they can deal with, come to it with a systematic plan, whether from the medical profession or someone who is good at dealing with those kinds of situations. There's no doubt that Israel needs it at this time, especially with Litzman and the director general leaving. Uh, Israel needs to see someone who they can trust in that position. And I certainly hope that it's not just a political pawn, but taken with the seriousness that it needs to be taken. Davi? Look at the hypocrisy of uh, Blue and White. During their entire uh, campaign, or actually three campaigns, uh, they hardly spoke about uh, security, uh, except few populist uh, uh, comments about the situation in the South. They never spoke about foreign affairs or what they, do they think about our relations with the Middle Eastern countries or with our Palestinian, so-called Palestinian neighbors. And they, the, the, the focus of their campaign were, uh, was on the health system. And suddenly, when they can get jobs of ministers, the health uh, system is not so important enough. I would, ex uh, I would, uh, I would like to hope, still to hope, uh, I would like to hope that uh, Mr. Uh, Gabi Ashkenazi will say that the, the political ticket of him is the health system and not the foreign affairs ministry because he has nothing to do there he is not uh, with enough experience to serve as a diplomat with all due respect and uh, but he has experience of managing big systems like that of course the idf first and foremost and i do believe that if they would like to express 
little bit of integrity after this blackmail in politics that they have 15 or something something like that ministers for such a small fraction at least take the health ministry without conditions and they, i think that the public uh, will punish them if they will uh, not uh, well, again, take responsibility. again though why do you think why do you think Moshe about Simontov and and Litzman i mean well Litzman said that he resigned uh, uh, in order to address housing issues within the Haredi community. But why do you think Moshe Bar Simontov is also resigning now? Why is it that nobody seemingly wants this position? Uh, well, uh, this you should ask him. I don't really have a answer, uh, uh, an answer, but I just can tell you that uh, uh, director generals of ministries, usually they leave when the minister uh, uh, is, is moving on. So it's uh, not, not uh, you know, uh, something which is really uh, dramatic. Ra you Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, same question to you, you know, and fi final moments, unfortunately. There's no doubt that there's a little bit of uh, consequences for the situation with Corona as well, and perhaps lack of preparedness. I should also mention the Director General of the Finance Ministry uh, is stepping down as well. These are two ministries that have been the most difficult in this situation. By the way, it also could just be people who are tired and want to go home and have a little bit of a break. For the last two, three months, these people have been working round the clock. Whether we agree with the job they've done or not, they have been working at the job, and there's a human element that's here as well, and that could be possible possibly why they're stepping back as well. All right, well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time in Elections Arena that we have today. I'd like to thank our guests, Davidi Hermelin and Rabbi Dov Lipman, and of course, thanks to all of you at watching at home. Uh, for more news from IL TV, please watch us on Facebook, uh, on our YouTube and our Roku TV channel. Thank you so much. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next time.